Consider this spring mass system. We don't apply any external force and there is no energy loss and friction of any kind. If we move the mass by a distance x, the spring applies the force on it which is equal to the stiffness k times the distance x. And it is opposite in direction to the displacement, therefore it has a negative sign. According to Newton's second law of motion, the force should be equal to the mass times the acceleration. This gives us the governing equation of our spring mass system. For simplicity, let's assume that the mass and the stiffness of spring are equal to 1. If you have seen this equation, you might recall that its solution is always presented as a sum of sine and cosine, and both the terms are multiplied by constants. Let's call them c1 and c2. But how do we come to this solution? The simplest answer could be that it is a second order linear differential equation. Also, we know that sine and cosine independently satisfy the equation. Therefore, the sum should define the complete solution. And the constants c1 and c2 are determined by the initial conditions. Let's take a step back here. How do we even know that sine and cosine satisfy the governing equation to start with? Did somebody try multiple functions and then found out? That definitely does not seem to be the best approach to solve the problem. Is there any generic method to obtain this solution? To find that, we will start from the very basic. Without loss of generality, we can write any differential function x of t as a power series with infinite terms. Let's write it in the expanded form up to the first 5 terms. Now we will differentiate it with respect to t. The constant a0 turns 0. Likewise, we get the terms a1 plus 2a2t plus 3a3t square and so on. Differentiating it, once again we get 2a2 plus 6a3t plus 12a4t square. In the interest of our differential equation, we care about these two equations. Let's substitute them into the differential equation. We have infinite series on both the sides. So now let's write them back in the compressed form. On the left side, we have a series from n equal to 0 to infinity with coefficients n plus 1 times n plus 2 times a n plus 2 and t raised to the power n. The right side is our simple power series just with a negative sign. Now if this is a general solution, this should satisfy for any value of t. Therefore the coefficient of every term must be equal. This gives a relation that each coefficient a n of the power series should satisfy. To make sense of this relation, let's try out some values of n. Starting with n equal to 0 we get a2 equal to minus a0 divided by 1 dot 2. For n equal to 1, we have a3 equal to negative of a1 divided by 1 dot 2 dot 3. I am writing the denominator in this fashion so that the formation of factorial term is clearly visible. Similarly, for n equal to 2, a4 is equal to minus of a2 divided by 3 dot 4. But a2 can be written in terms of a0 which gives us a4 equal to minus 1 square times a0 divided by 4 factorial. Let's do it one more time for n equal to 3 which gives a relation between a5 and a3 and then it can be rewritten in terms of a1. From this exercise we can see that all the even numbered coefficients are related to a0 and the odd numbered are related to a1 as written here. Let's rewrite the power series as the sum of even and odd number terms. Then substitute the values of the coefficients as we derived earlier. Now we can replace the even numbered n by 2 times m and odd numbered n by 2m plus 1. Still it is a very complex looking infinite series. Here we just need a small observation to simplify it which is that the first series is the power series of cosine and the second one is of sine. This final form is exactly what we were looking for and again the a0 and a1 are the constants 
that can be determined by the initial conditions.